What's up, everyone? Hey, Corey. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, Corey. You know who's really good to see? Norris. <laughs> you told him. He knew exactly what I was going to say. This is this is why Brian and I work so well together. He knew exactly what I was going to say. Anticipation. That's right. Um, I am here, and if you're on YouTube, you're seeing this too. Uh, I'm just I'm hanging with my friend Norris, who's got an epic, epic mustache. It's already been about the fifth time I've commented on it, but now we're officially recording. Check Norris, my- before we say anything else, I just want to know, like, what inspired you um, to grow just such an awesome mustache? Well, I was uh, at hunting camp, grew a beard, shaved it into this shape, and my wife liked it, so it's staying. That's, it's the you're literally part. the only man I know of who has said, my wife prefers me with a mustache. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know what to say about That's that. That's awesome. I'm just I making mean, a point yeah, I mean, of Nor- observation. Norris is a lucky man. Um, I do know that every time that Norris talks about his wife, or that I've been around, that you will, you will call her your girlfriend. It uh, it, it right. almost it almost always catches me off guard. So like the the email the other day was like, "Hey Norris, do you want to be a guest on our podcast?" Yeah, I'm traveling with my girlfriend right now, and it always catches me off guard just a little bit. Yeah. It works. It still works. All right, all right. She well, hey, let's let's. Girlfriend. We're gonna set this up today. So so Norris, I uh, just gave you a little bit of that background, but we've been we've been running through two four eights observations of urban uh, characteristics of urban movements, and Norris, I've I've heard of you learning from you of the over the last man five to eight years i don't remember the first time i I ran across some video about you um talking about you know farming and the northwest that leads to uh i don't know i'm excited to hear more about it at least the movement principles and all that stuff but before we go that i remember the first time anyone introduced me to you said something like you're like the only one who you like Terry Bradshaw, like t- touched your butt, like every day. You're like the only person I know. Is that, uh, I mean, can you un- unpack that a little bit for me? Cause I'm a little confused. <laughs> well, well. Back, uh, back in 1980, I had signed with the Steelers and uh, yeah. And I played center and guard. And so, yeah, I see <laughs> at, at, at some men's, uh, conferences I've alluded to the fact that Terry Bradshaw uh, touched my butt and <laughs> he's like, I haven't watched this clip. <laughs> You're so proud of yourself for bringing this up. No, I just, I've, I don't know if I've ever asked you about it. So that was the first time someone told me about, about you, Norris. Um, Why are you uh, blushing? Me? <laughs> no, it's just that natural <laughs> glow that I have. All right, brother. So um, I know Norris, a lot of what you've done over the last decades of your life and ministry have been finding leaders in other yeah. countries and empowering them and coming alongside them as their their primary leaders in their own people. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, but first, before we go into that, I'd l- we just love to hear a little bit of who you are, like um, a little bit of your background, but also just like, yeah, how'd you get into disciple making movement principles? planting the gospel that multiplies disciples. Yeah. Just give you the floor for a couple minutes to tell us who you are and how you got here. Yeah. So for, for me, this whole aspect of movements and disciple making movements fits into what God had already been doing in my life before I ever heard about it. And, and it started early on in my life uh, with my dad, who was a business guy who helped me to understand who I was and what my identity was and that my identity was never going to be tied to what I did and Mm -hmm. to my performance. And so that was a, that was big medicine for me as a little boy. He would say to me verbatim when I was a kid, if he saw me getting prideful about something, he would say, so which molecule of your existence are you taking credit for today? So, you know, (laughs) uh, well, the way that you can think, the way that you move. You don't ever get to say, look what I did. Mm. This is my thing. Because all of your existence, you were created for a relationship. And in, it's all for the kingdom. It's not for you. So those were early, early lessons for me. Mm. Another thing he said to me when I was a teenager, he said, whether you're scoring touchdowns or cleaning the toilet I said neither of those jobs define you hmm. no. you bring who you are to those jobs but if you don't know who you are then those jobs will define you 
and you'll think yeah. you're somebody really important or somebody really small and neither of those things are true so those were early foundational lessons in my life that still bear fruit today and I'm 65 years old now and mm. so I've always believed that every human and and you know God is pro human human being that every human gets to be able to hear from God and so I I have this little mantra that I like to that I live by um that we need to take Jesus out of the hands of experts and give him back to ordinary people like it was in the book of Acts. And so I, I'm a little bit, uh, yeah, I don't know if skewed is the right word, but, but experts don't start movements Hmm. and methods and techniques don't start movements. It's people who do. And God has already made it clear to me that, He's not waiting for me to show up somewhere before he starts working. And he's already speaking to people because he's that's what he does. He speaks to people. And everyone gets to hear his voice. Every human gets to hear God's voice, not just the experts. Mm -hmm. And when the experts keep Jesus all bottled up behind conferences or books or methods, then it's easy for people to self-select out and say, that's not for me. Hmm. That's for the experts. That's for the real spiritual people. And so that really informs my posture of entry into any place I ever go, whether it's right here in my hometown or overseas. My posture of entry has to be one that I believe that God's already there. He's already working. He's already speaking. And so I'm always asking this question everywhere I go. Who am I actually here to meet, Lord? Because hmm. I I'm it, there's no way I can make build a relationship with everybody. I want to I want to build a relationship with whoever you have prepared for me to to meet and to talk to. And so entering into these places, your posture of entry needs to be that you're carrying nothing. I mean, that's how Jesus sent people out with nothing except the kingdom of God. So it really informs how I enter into a place. I go with nothing. I I don't assume in any way, and I believe it's arrogant to do so, to think I know what God wants to do in this place. I don't live there. I don't know that place. And so I go in with this this mentality, because especially when I go into places in Africa or the Middle East or you know, someplace they just my color of my skin. People assume I have everything. Mm-hmm. So how do I enter with nothing except the kingdom of God? Mm. So I never use, I don't ever go in and use PowerPoint and workbooks. I really believe that it's all about helping people learn how to hear from God themselves and asking God questions, real time questions. And then letting him speak to people. So that's what I mean by a posture of entry, a posture of humility where you actually see yourself lower than those you're going in to Mm. serve. And you raise them up from the very beginning. So you're not having to transition into national leadership or leadership in, you know, whatever ghetto you might be in or whatever city you might be in. Let's raise those leaders up from the beginning. Mm. And so that's how I've been entering into these places, asking God questions. Who is it that I'm here to meet? And then I just listened to him. Mm-hmm. And then he, he he pointed out Nadim back in 2003 in the Middle East. And and uh, right from the, the first time I met him, God told me, I want you to pay attention to this guy. Mm-hmm. And same thing happened in Nigeria. Same thing happened in Uganda. And so meeting these people and then spending time discipling them, coaching and mentoring them, and never being in the place of leading them, but in a place of serving them, mm. and never assuming that I know what they need, because the insiders know what they need much better than I do. Mm-hmm. I'm a cherry farmer from Kashmir, Washington, and... That's how I travel, actually. I introduce myself as a cherry farmer 
not as a missionary because people will still talk to farmers. They don't yeah. change yeah. the way they talk because I'm a missionary or I'm an expert in movements or, you know, they'll, mm-hmm. they, they stop being real with you and they yeah. start talking about things they think you want to hear because you're a missionary, but farmers, they're, they're safer. I, mean, I can talk to a farmer mm. and so I don't know if they, that's a bit of introduction, you know, to, to this topic, insider leaders. I, I just believe the, that in every place I go, I want to be in a listening posture with mm-hmm. God, with the people, and let them hear from God themselves. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's so good. So given a little bit of more meat to this con- this this conversation in the context that we're in here is, so that same idea, right, is is here in an urban context, you know, like we're just like Kansas City, two point three million people, uh, the same idea, but even on a on a, a very micro level, right? So like more and more, uh, you know, understanding of, of people groups and around affinity groups and just people that we have a reason to be around, like we're trying to always find those insiders. Uh, as close to the ground as possible, have a, have a reason to exist. Right. So a lot of that, like people, they're hearing this, they know that, you know, we've sat on this subject already a little bit on this podcast. The reason why I wanted to bring you in on this um, is because of the global picture that you've seen now for the last, I don't know, couple decades, maybe you can unpack a little bit of what you've done. Um, I mean, you just mentioned Nadim. And I've been trying, Nadim's going to be on this podcast at some point. He said, yes, we just got to figure out when, uh, and, you know, we were sitting in a room together, was that last year with a bunch of Novo yeah. leaders and the dean leading that time. And uh, and it's great because I don't think anything in that room we would have said, hey, Norris found this guy, right? I mean, you're just in the back of the room, just chilling, just hanging. I mean, there, was, there wasn't an expert vibe coming off of you, uh, even though you've been doing this forever and you live and breathe it. Uh, it's very much like you're, you're doing exactly what you described is like you find the one who could reach the mini who's the insider and it's like you're just raising that person up um but what what we've seen in the middle east the fruit of that ministry is crazy i mean dude just crazy stuff uh that nadim and all the the people on the ground there so it's just a as an outsider looking in i'm like that's amazing just watching that but is there like maybe unpack a little bit of the history like what was like the early years uh, experimenting with some of this, some of the, if there's any stories that come up as you've been a global catalyst, we're just story time with Norse. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this idea of inside leaders, uh, you know, I'd read some things about it. Um, but to be, to be really honest and candid when, when I first went into the middle East in 2003, everybody told me I was going to fail going in with this posture because they said, that's not how missionaries work. You need to go, you need to learn the language and you got to do it, do it that way. And, and I, I was, I, to each one who came to me with those (laughs) admonitions that of intimate or uh, failure in the horizon, I would say, man, I've, I'm glad that's what God's called you to do. And I want you to be wildly successful in that. But that's not what he's talking to me about. That's not Mm -hmm. what he's telling me. What he's telling me is I want you to go and find the people I've already been speaking to. Mm -hmm. And I want you to stay underneath them from the beginning and raise them up to lead. And, and so it, it morphed into this, uh, one of the early trainings I'll do with leaders is how do you become a leader of no reputation Mm. to where you're never getting your identity from a title or a position Mm -hmm. in the kingdom of God, but you're actually learning how to be a leader like Jesus was where he really was, it was in a posture of, of a servant and so raising up that person And then modeling that for them so that they can do the same thing. They can actually do that. So I'll give you even a more recent example over the last four years in Uganda. My first trip there was a little over 
four years ago now. It, was, it would have been four years in, in December. And I went there at the invitation of a guy who was going to be traveling around. I'd, been, I'd spent some time with this guy literally the week before. And he said, hey, why don't you go with me to Uganda? And I said, when? He goes, on Saturday, which was like in four days. And normally I would, I would say no to that. But I felt the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to go. And I talked to my girlfriend and she said, I think, I think you're supposed to go too. And so um, not, I had no agenda. You understand? I, mm -hmm. I, w I went there at the invite of another guy who was going to be traveling f from Kampala all the way, you know, to the Sudanese border, meeting people. So I just went with that. And I, of course, my mind went, okay, Lord. You're, you've organized this. Who am, I, who am I here to meet? And we began to meet leaders. That's what he was doing. He was meeting leaders of things. But the Holy Spirit kept turning my, turning my head to the driver of our car. The guy who was the one driving us around. Faisal Katayenge. Mm -hmm. Muslim guy. He's a follower of Jesus now, but he's Muslim mm -hmm. background. And... Uh, he didn't even he didn't even like me. <laughs> he he actually we were in Gulu and he calls his wife or his fiance at the time. And he says, I'm sick of these guys because, you know, white missionaries had always been something that had caused trouble for them. Hmm. And he had been involved with some white guys for some time. And so he was done. He called her and says, I'm leaving. I'm just going to give him my car and let him go. And his wife, Ruth, said, I think you're supposed to get to know this guy, Norris. Not sure why. Hmm. So he stayed and drove us. And we started building a relationship. And of all the leaders that I met, he was the one, the Holy Spirit, I want you to pay attention to this guy. And so we just did. I just started spending time with him. And I watched him for two years beginning to implement slowly each of these things that we we introduced. And I would always ask him, I said, now, how are you going to make this Ugandan? Mm. So whatever it is that we spent time talking about, and we literally, there was never a time when we sat and looked at a PowerPoint together, or we went through a workbook. We sat and asked Jesus questions about specific things as it relates to movement. And, it, and I was just trusting the Lord in this process. And now Faisal, he's got a team. And in four years, they got over 300,000 people already involved in DBS groups, mm. all young, all across the nation. And I would go and I would just spend time with leaders from like the ghetto and then teachers and then professionals. It's, it's in every socioeconomic group, right now happening praise god and yeah. you know i was just there in december and here's a guy that a year ago when i prayed for him he was the leader of a gang and now he's making shoes and employing other gang leaders we actually had the mayor of that city come to us we had a hundred people from the ghetto saying we don't know what you guys are doing but it's changing our city mm, amen because these guys are changing and it's all happened with Ugandans discipling Ugandans. Mm -hmm. And I spend time with just a few each time. And it's so that's a that's a recent story. You know, Nadim and I have known each other for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, and when we started, neither one of us had heard of DMM. Yeah. Right. Um, yep. So it was uh, those early days we were learning it together. But as far as the empowering of the national leader, that's something God put in my heart a long time ago. Hmm. And so I just I've just seen him honor that in, in these places. Yeah. And I yeah. and I believe that some of those same principles are transferable to urban environments. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. do, you know. Well, that's exactly what I think I was going to shift that that question to. Of, but I mean, you, you obviously you're an American. You live here. Uh, you understand the nuances, the differences of an American context. I mean, probably more than almost anyone else because you traveled so many different places. Like, what's transferable? 
you know, as an average American here in this concept, I mean, it's amazing. What does that look like in your mind, you know, on the ground for the average American who's trying to reach their people and make disciples? Well, the posture of listening to God, mm-hmm. right, yeah. doesn't change. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's when we think we know what to do that I think we get into trouble. Yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. like I'm a cherry farmer, right? And so I'm I'm really wanting to get better fruit. So I go to a conference and they say, you know what? We added potash to our soil and man, our we, our cherries are like crazy. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going home and I go home and I put potash in my soil and all the trees start dying because my soil was already full of potash. And that's what, what I described as what we often do in Christianity. Mm-hmm. This is the latest, greatest thing. And now we're just going to transfer this same thing to from place to place. Mm-hmm. Instead of going into a place and listening to God, because he all, he's never scratching his head going, man, this is a tough now? place. I, I don't know what to do here. Mm. God, God never has that response. We mm. do. And But when we fail to listen to God, when we fail to go into the tent of meeting and ask him for the new tactics for the next battle, mm. where, where to go? All the little details. We, do, we stop listening and we think we know what to do because this worked over here. That's right. So that's one thing that's huge, hugely transferable that we don't often do. Amen. And I think one of the other pieces that for me has been I've been going after this for about a decade um, because we're good at helping people know how to hear God's voice in the quiet. You know, we all want to have our quiet time. But most of my life is busy. Most of my life is chaotic. What does his voice sound like in chaos? What does his voice sound like in the busy din of each person's ordinary life? What does his voice sound like? And helping men and women learn how to hear God's voice in their normal, ordinary life. And hearing God versus saying, well, I'm just too busy. I can't hear from God. Mm. Why would we let the enemy be Lord of busyness? Yeah. And busyness is one of the things that ramps up in urban environments as to why movements don't happen. Because everybody's busy. Yep. Which is true. I'm busy. I'm 65. I'm busier than I've ever been in my whole life. <laughs> but I I have learned how to hear from God in the moment and ask him questions in the moment. And that's what I'm trying to disciple people into. Jesus is not waiting for you to do something more spiritual. That's right. Mm. He's right there with you in whatever job you're doing. And you can have conversations with him all through the day because he cares about every little thing you're doing. That's right. And so this idea of listening and hearing from God, if it's easy to sidestep that and just bring in methods. Yeah. But that has to be a, a critical starting point. And, it, and everywhere I've gone, it transfers. Kampala is a huge city. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. And dense, right? Mm. And people are, you know, you know what it's like in the middle of it. I mean, it's just this, mm. there's a rhythm that's there that you kind of can see and understand. And Jesus is right there. He's right there in the middle of all of it. That's right. Yeah. But if we don't believe that, if we don't practice it, that as leaders, how are we going to help others? Mm to hear from God that way in these simple, simple things. And the other part for me that uh, I think, at least from Norris's perspective, my, any training that I do has to be able to be done by everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. Or why am I training it? Am I only training the experts? Or does it transfer to every person and that just informs everything that I do because the enemy is so good at helping people to self-select out yeah yeah they'll say well I 
I guess I, you know, I guess you got to have this degree or you, I have to have gone to that conference or, um, you know what? I, I really am not a good speaker. Um, I don't know. I don't know what you're hearing there, but I think that there's so much that's transferable that we're not even transferring because we're relying on methods and tools, which are good. But how do we know those are the tools God wants us to use unless we're listening to him? Mm, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Brian, he says, I don't know what you're hearing. <laughs> Brian, what are you hearing? I just love the, the the thing that transfers no matter what culture is just to listen for Jesus' voice and to join him. And uh, just the, I was sitting with somebody yesterday or Tuesday reminded me of this, this first Thessalonians passage that, Paul is writing to the the believers there and saying, like, I, I, I want to urge you to live like this more and more. And if you jump down, it's this uh, live a quiet and simple life. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like yeah. you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that daily you might win the respect of outsiders. I mean, that's not like spot on, like center target of what you're saying, but it is in the sense of like, man, we're we're mm. so often pursuing the next big thing, the next, you know, whatever is going to feel like the the thing that unlocks it that moves us towards this or toward that um but yeah that's what i love hearing from yeah. you that i think people can walk away with is it, you know just to walk into a new space and say who am i supposed to meet here and it might be nobody and don't try to what? manufacture it mm -hmm. that's right listen and I obey. Have, that's right we I, we're, we're building a carport at our house and we started it last fall and I hired this guy to, and he, you know, as I was traveling and he, he said, yo, you should take about a week to build this footing and this pour in place wall. It took four weeks, it took a month, <laughs> over a month. And I'm just getting pissed off about everything. And, and, and uh, you know, I gotta be careful. I know this is being recorded. I won't cuss. So <laughs> um, Brian never cusses. I, my wife kept saying, Norris, you got to bless this guy. You don't know what, what's going on in his life. Don't go off on him. I want you to, you know, keep this posture of blessing. So it finally comes to the day we're going to pour, you know, these retaining walls. And a guy shows up that I hadn't seen before. And it's a guy that he hired. Well, the Holy Spirit immediately pointed him out to me as I'm out there because I, I was just out there helping, you know, just trying to do what I can. And But this guy was hustling. I mean, he was outworking everybody. <laughs> so I just went over and said, man, I just want you to know I see you, brother. You're really hustling, and I, I appreciate that. And, you know, we started talking, and pretty soon this guy's troweling concrete and sobbing into my shoulder. <laughs> you know, he goes, I'm 60 days sober, and I just got out of jail i'm trying to i want to get back to my wife my son then he comes over the next day in his pickup and we spend two hours just praying in his pickup he hears from god his identity mm. now he's been i've been spending this time with him and the holy spirit said to me it's never just a construction job mm. the reason it took four weeks is i wanted you to meet this guy well, yeah and you know, so what is our perspective about what's happening? Huh. If it's just I'm so busy, we stop seeing. Mm. We stop hearing because there's always more going on. And I believe the enemy it loves it that we use busyness, that he's the Lord of busyness. Mm. And busyness keeps me from actually hearing God's voice. Wow. You know, we say things like, and I got to go back and reconnect to God. Like somehow I'm faster than him and he can't keep up with me. Right. I got to go back and reconnect when he's always there mm. and he's always present yep. and he's always doing way more than we think. And so, so that's why in this, in Kansas city or in Kashmir, it's a different starting point. And unless I'm listening to God, I won't know what the starting point is. Yeah. Yeah. I can That's... make generalizations. I can, you know, there's lots of things that are true about urban environments. But if what if those things were actually opportunities 
-hmm. and not obstacles. Like what if those things could actually be redeemed somehow as opportunities that actually define where your starting point is? That's good. That's so good. Yeah. Bro, I mean, yeah, as we're, I mean, I, I could sit here and listen, man, to just to that all day. If not, I mean, if nothing else. And I think you're I know that that's been something that's pretty significant in your heart and your ministry of the last few years is helping people hear from God and, and hear their how God sees them, their identity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know that's so powerful. Maybe that's a that's a podcast for another day to ask you uh, just about that. But yeah, I'm with you, man. I think that even in the whole discovery Bible study process, I mean, really in the end, what we're doing is we're listening to God and we're helping others learn how to listen to God. That's like it. our disciple making process from the ground up with people who are, I mean, I'm doing this with a handful of people right now who have never really ever, ever touched the Bible, been in a church. Like there's actually someone recently in a DBS environment here that their I will statement I mean, they're in a hard situation, bad roommates, pretty toxic, pretty abusive relationship. And this person's I will statement was, I'm going to pray for my roommates, and uh, which is really cool, right? Okay. And then about three minutes later, I said, hey, have you ever prayed for anyone before? He goes, nope. Like, <laughs> so, so I was like, just kind of dumbfounded for a second. I was like, the first time you've ever really been in a setting like this, you're, you're immediately putting into action, you're going to pray for your enemies, uh, that most of us Christians don't even have a clue how to do that, right? Circled back a week later, asked him how it was going, you know, a few days later. And he was like, oh, it's been great. I've been doing it every day. I've been, uh, and he said, I've been like spending time. He, he was calling it meditation and praying during that. And I was just like, I'm just blown away, man. And, and I'm like, I could have sat here and taught him a lot of stuff. Right. Like, but we just opened the Bible and said, what is God showing to you? Right. Like, even at the very ground level, we're doing the same thing. We're just asking, we're just trying to get people at the feet of Jesus to hear what he has to say, what Amen. he thinks. Um, and so I'm hearing you about the same thing with leader development. Yeah. Where, for us, we're identifying yeah. disciple makers. We're looking for leaders, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, man, like I, I, we could talk and talk and talk and talk. So I want to, I want to ask you one thing and then anything you'd want to add to that is, is like so we here in Kansas City we're running after this we got a few hundred people running after trying to make disciples we got you know I don't know how many micro churches and settings like that over 100 or 130 or something like that what we're trying to we just want more and more and more we want more people joining Jesus in the everyday places hearing his voice making disciples right um we want to know if is God pressing on you anything to tell us cuz we're all ears like we're all ears so I'm going to ramble here for a minute or two or a few seconds, or Brian, if you have anything to say here, just as, as Norris, you're, you're hearing from the Lord. But I, I will maybe summarize this also as anyone listening. Um, yeah, this is, this is so true. No matter how, I don't know, this is the right analogy, how high on the ladder you get, whatever, whatever leadership looks like, right? I mean, it is, it is, it's the same principle, right? If your neighborhood or your friend group, it's the same thing of, you know, the Middle East, that Norris talks about is finding, finding the insiders, yeah. finding people of reason to, to exist. So I'm rambling now, but Norris, yeah, we're all here. I, yeah, I, I'm hearing something pretty clear and it has to do with, um, the, the my cherry trees. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you, you'll never pick an apple off of a cherry tree. <laughs> Impossible. Cause they know who they are. The problem with their identity is not that they don't know that they're a cherry tree, but all the things that happen that you, me, the orchardist, I have to train that tree to produce fruit because on its own, it grows wild and it, every year it produces suckers Uh every year. And I have to ch- take those suckers out of the tree every year. And you know they're suckers because they produce beautiful leaves. And they suck all this energy producing leaves when that tree's identity is to produce cherries, hmm. produce fruit. And in order for it to produce fruit, you, the, the farmer, you have to, you have to prune out all of those suckers that are growing and they grow every year and the tree will not prune itself. Mm. 
you have to do it. It's done in community. Hmm. It's done together. In that passage in John 15, where it says, in every branch in me that bears fruit, I prune it so that it'll be, bear more fruit. And what most people don't understand agrarian, you know, symbols like Jesus, you know, those people that in his day, they understood perfectly what he was talking about. Because when you have a branch that's producing fruit and you prune the end of it, right, you, you cut it. Well, what it does is it can no longer just get longer. Mm -hmm. All the energy is pushed back into the branch mm -hmm. to produce more fruit. Mm -hmm. And the pruning process makes the tree feel like it's going to die. Mm -hmm. And the principle was, is you have to hurt the tree. The tree, the pruning is like, oh, no, well, I, I, this hurts. And out of that wounding comes fruit. Mm -hmm. And it actually produces fruit from its identity. This is what I was made to do. I was created to bear fruit, to make cherries. And it's the same whether it's any kind of fruit tree. Mm -hmm. And so this pruning process is really the 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 thing that we seldom do in Christianity. We actually we actually don't ask these questions that often. And then we what we end up doing is redefining main maintenance as success. Mm -hmm. We're maintaining what we have and we call that success. And I just really believe Jesus is a fruit lover. He just loves that we bear fruit. And the way that people are going to bear fruit the best is when they get to know who they really are. Mm -hmm. That's why identity is so precious to me. And that people know who they are because identity is under attack in every way possible in our world right now. And we have the answer. Mm -hmm. We can help people come to know who they really are, mm -hmm. know their identity. And so when you... When you build teams based around identity, it's no longer a job description. Yeah. And there's no, I'm not competing to be like Corey because Corey gets to be Corey and I get to be Norris and Brian gets to be Brian. And now we know who's, because you're, each of us are going to be better at something than somebody else because that's what, that's who we are. That's how God made us. That's how he wired us. And when we're watching these teams being built around identity, competition goes away. Mm. People aren't striving to be somebody they're not because they know who they are. They've heard it from Jesus himself, who they are, who he says that they are. And then they can start pruning away all the things that are keeping them from living out their true identity mm -hmm. in the kingdom of God. And it's a powerful thing that Jesus described in that whole John, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, because I've seen it come alive in my orchard. I've, I've watched those passages come alive to me mm. as I've learned what happens in this process and how Jesus wants to do that with us, and we do it together. And it's, it's, not, it's not an easy process. We like our suckers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. We do. And so having that courage to ask Jesus, so what is it that you want me to stop doing mm -hmm. that's keeping me from living out my truth? What are the suckers in my life right now? And everybody's got them. Mm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we kind of like them. Uh, I had a, a, a cherry sucker this morning. It was a blow pop. <laughs> Just saying, a lot, of, a lot of things coming together there. Uh, coincidence? I think not. All right, Norris, love your brother, man. So grateful uh, for you to spend yeah. some time with us and all that wisdom, man. It was, it was so good, so good to hear from you. And, uh, dude, I, I can't wait to figure out how to be in the same room with you sometime soon. Yeah, would love that, guys. Thank you so much. It was an honor to be here. All right, Bless you, brother. You.